Um, welcome everybody to uh, Network and Learn. I was just looking uh, today, this is actually our 17th Network and Learn for the UDL IRN. So we're delighted to have you here tonight. Uh, we're de delighted to have such a wonderful panel as well. Um, we, it, you're in for a great evening of conversation and um, wisdom, uh, hopefully good questions along the way as well. Uh, so tonight's Network and Learn is entitled, Can Educators Afford to Ignore Executive Function? Developing Expert Learners and UDL. Um, and we just want to remind you that these Network and Learns are interactive. We value your questions. They are what make our show go, if you will. So if you've got questions, please uh, send them out to uh, hashtag UDL IRN. Uh, we'll be monitoring questions in the background and posing those to our panelists throughout our hour together tonight. Uh, you can also, if you're watching live um, via the webinar, you can also put your questions in the chat space. So my name is Susan Harden and I'll be moderating tonight's panel. Uh, I am on the uh, board of directors for the UDL IRN and I'm really excited to be here tonight. I was saying before we got started that um, we, we really do have an excellent panel and, uh, and a little intimidating because they all know so much about uh, neuropsychology, but, um, and, but we're really excited to hear what they have to say. So to, to tell you who is joining us tonight, we have Lisa Beth Carey. Lisa is the Senior Education Consultant at Kennedy Krieger Institute. We also have Lisa Jacobson. She's a faculty neuro, neuro, neuropsychologist at Kennedy Krieger Institute, and Alexis Reed, who is a director of learning-based services at the Boston Child Study Center. Um, joining us also tonight is our very own Brian Dean. Brian will be monitoring the Twitter and the chat tonight and bringing questions to our panel. Just a reminder how uh, this Network and Learn panel process works. We are using the 2020-20 protocol. That means 20 minutes we'll be talking about the issues connected to education and students with executive function issues. Then we'll talk for 20 minutes about some potential solutions, and then we'll just have a conversation at the end. In between, we'll be peppering in your questions. Uh, and again, that's kind of what propels the whole conversation. Um, so do feel free to share with us. Um, we want to hear your ideas. We want to hear your thoughts. We want to hear your questions. And don't forget, the hashtag is UDLIRN. And so to kick it off, we are going to get started. I'm going to mute my microphone in just a moment, and we're going to get started. And uh, Lisa is going to share with us just what is executive function. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about executive function, but first I want to align it with the UDL framework. So as most of you know, um, executive function is part of the UDL guidelines. And um, the way that it's phrased in UDL guidelines is not always completely similar to how it is in the executive function literature that um, a lot of people who do research and clinical work in the field would think about it. Um, so I want to explain how those things connect for everybody um, who's watching. Um, and I'm sorry, Lisa, I just had to stop there for a moment. I lost my screen, but I want to bring it back up. So you just keep talking. All right. So um, for most of the literature, we think about three important components to executive function. So the first would be inhibitory control, which is the ability to purposefully stop an action. So imagine that someone is annoying you, your first response would be to lash out at them, but you stop yourself because that's not a great behavior to be engaging in. The second piece is working memory. That's the ability to hold information in mind while you're manipulating it and using it. Um, and the third piece is flexible thinking. So that includes the three pieces that are part of the executive function guidelines in the UDL framework, which are goal setting, um, planning and strategy, and then self-monitoring. So those pieces fall into the flexible thinking. So if we think about executive function as a hierarchy of skills, you have inhibitory control, 
then working memory, and then flexible thinking. And the pieces that are highlighted by the guidelines are those flexible thinking components. So if we look at the next slide, just wanted to show you exactly where that is in the framework. So under the action and expression principle, under the guideline of options for executive functions. So those three different checkpoints that are listed there, those are all part of that flexible thinking piece. Um, and we're highlighting that because what the three of us are going to talk about tonight has to do also with that inhibitory control component and the working memory piece, because those support the ability to use the flexible thinking piece. Lisa, can I give a shout out to the new guidelines that Cass just put out today, <laughs> yesterday? Yes. Today? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty cool, very interactive. If you haven't seen them yet, everybody should check them out. <laughs> Good point. Thank you. All right. So if we look at the next slide, I want to start off with talking about the problem that I've seen and something that I think as educators we need to pay attention to. Um, so there, as we have more and more instructional technology in our classrooms, we think about how technology can aid in accessibility, how students can have the playing field leveled for them depending on what, how they need to access information. All of that is wonderful, but I think we need to keep in mind that as students use technology, that we're actually asking them to use a lot of those executive function skills that I just talked about. So I have here um, an example of two students, and these are actually students I observed in a classroom, and they were both playing math game um, to practice math skills. And the first student is noticing patterns, they're developing a strategy, they're monitoring themselves, and they're maintaining and sustaining attention. The second student is making random actions. They're just kind of jamming on the space bar. They're growing frustrated and agitated, and then they can't maintain their attention. What happened in this scenario is that student number two actually wound up throwing their laptop across the room and then not being allowed to use technology for the rest of the day and being punished. But if you know about executive function, you would have seen that student number two was just having a really hard time in this context using those executive function skills um, to support what they were supposed to be doing for the learning activity. So if we look at the next slide, um, we can kind of break down those different skills that student number two had trouble with. So they were having difficulty paying attention, they were having difficulty thinking and holding in mind the different things they were supposed to know. So they were having trouble with the math facts and the math problem solving skills, holding that information in mind while thinking about the rules of the game and thinking about how the computer functioned. Um, and then they weren't able to develop strategies or self monitor or problem solve. Um, and we're seeing that a lot when we see kids using computers, that they have to use their inhibitory control to not look at things they're not supposed to, like cool videos. Um, they're using their working memory to remember not just the content that they're supposed to be interacting with, but the functions of the computer. So what was my password and what's my username? Um, and then they're having to use their flexible thinking skills when they're having to troubleshoot on their devices, um, try and problem solve around how do I use this software versus that software. And that's adding to layers of complexity of executive function when kids are using technology. And that's not to say that kids shouldn't be using technology in the classroom. It's just something that as educators, we need to be aware of so that we're planning ahead and supporting those skills as the demand increases. So if we look at the next slide, we can have actually have Lisa Jacobson kind of jump in unless there are questions so far. Are you ready for me to jump in? Yes. Great. Okay. Next slide. There we are. Um, so as Lisa set the framework for us, one problem that we can see is that some students may fail to work up to their potential. And that's a concept that floats around quite a bit. And so however you define that concept of working to your potential, we know that there can be a gap between what we think children are capable of doing and what they actually produce. Um, and executive dysfunction or the inability to apply these control functions that Lisa described may help to explain that gap between what children know and what they're able to do. And so for that reason, we talk about executive function as a critical facilitator 
of other skills. So it means that executive function supports and improves other skills that are not necessarily executive in of themselves. So for example, uh, just like in the game that Lisa described, the students might have strong reasoning skills and good reading ability, but they might not be able to inhibit distractions and concentrate, filtering out things that are not relevant. Um, they might not be able to extract the most relevant information from a written passage, and then hold that information in mind long enough to actually answer questions about the assignment or the passage that they've read. Um, likewise, they might know their basic math facts, but not be able to recall and apply those facts in a sequence in the right order. Um, and so in both of those cases, the academic skills themselves might be present, but the application or the demonstration fails because a student might have executive dysfunction. Um, and so this helps to explain for us um, why some children who have appropriate intelligence don't perform to their potential. And it helps us explain this gap between knowing and doing appropriately. Sorry, the figure is on top of the word doing. Um, next slide, please. Uh, next bullet, please. There we go. Um, sorry, animation here. So executive functions are so critical to development of academic skills that it's really important for us to think about them as another core learning skill, not a soft skill that's unrelated. Um, and executive functions help to support the development of academic skills in both task specific ways and in more generalized or what we call domain general kinds of of ways. Um, the research evidence indicates for us that executive function skills are critical for the development of both math and reading, and that these associations persist over time. Um, hit the next bullet, please. Um, there are, sorry, longitudinal studies um, that go into middle and high school grades and beyond that show that these weaknesses in executive function can persist over time, um, but also that early executive function skills measured either prior to school or early in the school career do predict later outcomes, just as early cognitive abilities predict later outcomes. Um, and one of the most important things for teachers to recognize is that uh, there's a lot of evidence suggesting that children with learning disabilities are more likely to have executive dysfunction than their peers. So that puts them at an even greater greater disadvantage in the classroom. Next slide, please. Um, so finally, um, another issue is that executive function is critical to targeting intervention correctly. So we know that not all students that have given skill gaps are going to respond to the same interventions and certainly not at the same rate. Um, and so research shows us very clearly that interventions may be less effective if teachers don't target both the reading skills or the core academic skill and the underlying executive weaknesses. So for example, the metacognitive skills as well as the actual decoding or fluency skill. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so one of the things that I think is maybe a surprise to individuals um, who haven't thought about working memory in a, in a while or, or in the same way that we've been presenting is that working memory demands or broader demands for executive function in a setting can actually reduce the quality of, of performance. Um, and so we ran a study here at the Kennedy Career Institute. One of my colleagues um, did the study looking at um, children's performance on a go no go task. And so a go no go task is basically where a student will or a participant will uh, press a button if they see a certain a certain image on a screen so in this case we kept it very simple for children um, green means go so if you see a green spaceship you hit the button uh, if you see a red spaceship you don't so that's the go and the no go uh, when we gave them a more complicated task the instruction was go on green just like you do on the simple task but also go on red but only if the red spaceship is preceded by an odd number of green spaceships. So we ramped up the working memory demand. And so this study included children with ADHD, so children that we know are at high risk for executive dysfunction, and typical uh, control children, children with no identified disabilities whatsoever. Um, next slide, please. And so when these children performed the simple task, remember green means go and red means no go, you can see from this figure that the children with ADHD, that's represented by the yellow square, uh, had a little over a third um, percent commission errors. So they made errors indicating that they hit those red targets, the red spaceships, when they shouldn't. Um, and the controls made about 25-ish percent errors. Um, so that's a normal rate 
is that uh, you would have some errors because children are learning and not everybody's good at inhibiting that response of hitting the button to a red spaceship. Um, however, when we gave them the more complex task where they had to hit the green spaceship, but also hit the, hit the button for a red spaceship if it was preceded by an odd number of greens, uh, can you click that off? You'll see that the performance of the children that are typically developing was just as bad as the performance of the children with ADHD on this simple task. Um, so in other words, children who struggle to inhibit their initial responses in order to more carefully consider their actions tend to make more errors of omission. And we can actually increase this error rate increase by increasing the working memory demands and the inhibitory control demands. Uh, so this isn't surprising. It was a harder task. But the translation of this is there's direct relevance in the classroom where the level of demand can directly impact how well students are able to perform on a given task. So if you give longer, more complex directions, limited options for movement, um, demands for really long periods of sustained attention, you can actually create executive dysfunction in your students. Next slide. I like to share with some of the learners I work with that we all experience executive dysfunction at some points in time, whereas exhaustion or lack of some fundamental needs can sometimes shift the way in which we are carrying out tasks and the way in which our, our abilities to cognitively and flexibly shift and also retain information from a working memory standpoint can be um, impacted by different factors. So I love that study. Thank you. Um, uh, can we proceed to the next slide? So a couple um, things that I'm going to quickly address in addition to what Lisa and Lisa said, I can just say Lisa, <laughs> um, is that I'm going to talk a little bit about how the expectations of both uh, an educator and a learner or even an adult and a learner can actually shift um, the way in which executive skill development or dysfunction carries out talk a little bit about perceived resources versus demands, as well as skill and performance deficit, and a little bit about the prevalence of disengagement and lack of resilience with learners. We'll talk about the proposed solutions a little bit later. Next slide, please. So I wanted to kind of just pose this image that oftentimes students are asked to be in one specific place doing exactly what the person in front of them is telling them to do. So how does this image actually relate to what the experiences of each learner is, is having on a daily basis, where they're asked to think outside of the box and be really creative and critical strategic thinkers, but they have to follow every step that the teacher's giving them. And there is great benefit to providing scaffold in certain situations and being clear about expectations. However, we also want to allow each individual learner to understand how they learn best and have a lot of different options to be able to do that. So our environment can't be static. It can't be rigid because <laughs> we don't want rigid learners. We want them to be able to shift and you know, establish and understand their capacities, their strengths, and also the areas that they're trying to develop. So when we think about those different pieces of the environment, we might want to change physical structures in the environment, right? The physical structures around me. Right now I'm in somebody else's office where the air conditioning is actually on in Boston and I'm feeling a little cool. That is actually affecting my processing right now. So how do things that we can manipulate and change in the environment actually affect executive function? The ability to activate these skills when higher demands are presented. Um, also maybe in the way in which information is being presented as the UDL framework and guidelines helps us to have different options to be able to make adjustments and proactively plan for these situations that might not be ideal to learning. Um, or also on the individual level, how much do we need to skill each individual up to understand what they need to do in different situations? Though it might not be ideal circumstances for the way they learn best, can we actually equip them and help them to be um, better have more autonomy in a situation that might not be ideal for them, that they can compensate or scale up their executive function skills when the demands get higher. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is, um, for those who haven't seen something like this before, not only is 
our brain impacting the way in which we learn, all of these other factors around us are also affecting the way in which we learn. So thinking about an interactional uh, didactic experience instead of it just being that single experience that we expect to go in a certain way because we plan this amazing lesson that's going to go exactly as we expected it to and everybody's going to do exactly what we said. <laughs> um, that's not always reality. We have to also consider all of the different things that can affect your executive function, the way in which you feel if you're feeling anxious in a moment, if you're feeling dysregulated in a moment, if you're feeling any kind of sensory physical stimulation that is distracting you in some way, or if you have something that's happening at home that you're bringing with you or outside of the classroom that you're bringing with you into a learning experience, how do all of those things actually affect a learner and their executive function skills from being fully activated to reach that potential that was mentioned earlier? So we also, in being UDL thinkers, want to proactively plan for all of these different things that can actually veil or disengage our executive function skills at different points in time. Can we switch to the next slide? Thank you. Um, sorry to have you all read, but this is just a cute little example how the sometimes our brains and our hearts, our motivation can be deactivated, even though our skill set is activated. We might have all of the skills, but sometimes our motivation cannot allow us to activate them when we need to. So thinking about this disengagement conundrum that we hear so much about in the classrooms, um, it's not only happening in the classrooms, it's happening elsewhere. And we could have a whole nother talk for hours and hours and hours about how there's such a prevalence of what we what we're labeling as disengagement in learning, but also anxiety in the classrooms and depression of young learners that's really affecting the activation of executive function skills. Oftentimes those who have anxiety and depression, though I'm not gonna go into it today, their executive function skills actually can't activate even if they do have the skill set. Oftentimes that gets deactivated and weighs down that experience so they can't practice support and strengthen those skills. So the, the, the differential between the head of the heart as educators and adults around learners, especially young learners, helping them to identify challenge and what we do in the face of the challenge is really helpful, especially when it's scaffolded to support the development and strengthening of executive function skills will be key. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, in typical UDL fashion, I love to say what's getting in the way, what's the barrier. So not only do we want to think about the barriers, we also want to consider positive supports. And then also, especially for those who are labeled with ADHD or exhibit ADHD characteristics ever, which is mostly all of us, I think, at this point in time, how do we actually designate and identify these points of distraction that can really get in our way. Just acknowledging that this is distracting. This isn't my ideal way to learn. This is um, overstimulating for me in this moment. These directions aren't clear. I'm not, um, I don't feel comfortable asking for help when I don't know. All of these points of distraction can really present and magnify what are barriers in the classroom and how can we as educators and, and education enthusiasts enthusiasts actually build up positive supports and some of it comes from skill training acknowledging the fact that the front part of our brains doesn't develop <laughs> until much later in life so some of the demands we put on young learners they actually don't have that capacity in any given moment to be able to do the things we're asking them to. Just being mindful of that and helping young learners who may struggle despite their intellect will be really important to share that normal fact that our brains aren't always there yet and that's okay. And we can learn to get through that together. Next slide, please. Um, so we talked a little bit about this before. Thanks for the great setups. Uh, Lisa's <laughs> thinking about resources versus demands. Oftentimes, um, I see a lot of learners who are highly intellectual. They're really very verbally adept and they're able to really carry on sophisticated higher level conversations. And then they sit down to do a task that has multiple steps, that has too much information on one page, um, that is a little bit outside of what they feel comfortable navigating through and their demands actually shoot up through the roof and they think that their resources are so much lower than they might actually be. And despite whether or not they have that skill, if their perception of having or not having those skills is shifted, it will kind of shift that balance of what they think. Are they capable of taking on the task that's been presented to them or the assignment 
or the project or anything in any given moment. So we want to be mindful of what we're doing in terms of resources and demands and asking good questions to figure out how learners feel across time because we might have a skill or performance deficit. Is there a lack of skills? Is there a lack of even knowing there's different skills to use at different times? Or is there a performance deficit, something else getting in the way, that emotional piece, that heart piece that could be actually preventing them from accessing and activating their skills across time in different contexts. So we wanna be super mindful of you know, what is the barrier? What is getting in the way? And how can we best support and scaffold these learners in different ways? Next slide, please. So this is starting, I think, the, the solution section of the answer is to really get curious. Don't make assumptions. Please ask if we are able to figure out this skill versus performance deficit and understand the difference between what's happening. Are they lacking skills, which a lot of times highly intelligent, really bright, really engaged learners who shut down in one situation when they're given uh, an essay or a written assignment or something with too many steps. If they shut down, ask a question, don't assume. <laughs> so that hopefully will lead to more of our uh, discussion about possible solutions, interventions, and ways in which we can manipulate the environment to best support the growth and development of executive function skills. All right. Wow. You know, it just dawns on me that it's amazing to me that kids learn it all with all, all the possibility of uh, things that can go wrong. So um, thank you for sharing those great insights. And, and I, if I'm sure everybody watching is just now thinking about how important it is to address these skills head on and waiting with bated breath for what the, the solutions are. But before we do that, we're gonna to toss it over to Brian. I think we had some questions come in and um, we'll just get those out of the way and uh, and then we'll come back it together and do the solutions piece. Yeah, wow, you've got uh, you got a bunch of people, ladies, you have a bunch of people chomping at the bit for some, for some solutions, uh, asking really great questions out there. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to consolidate some of them, but uh, one of the biggest ones that, that came in uh, was how executive functioning or how executive functions fa facilitate self-determination. Um, and then I think that you answered some of those, but I think they're looking for a little bit of elaboration, uh, kind of throwing it to the, to the whole, to the whole panel um, to, uh, to throw out an answer if you have one. Hi. So um, one of the ways that we can think about executive function is that it's the, um, the skills that help you get the job done. So it's not necessarily the knowledge. It's not the content piece of it. It's the ability to take the information and then do something with it. So what we see very frequently with students or learners of any age who are struggling with executive function skills is that they start to doubt their ability. So even if they have lots and lots of content knowledge um, or lots of skills in other ways, then being able to transfer that knowledge and that learning into demonstrating it or doing something with it that's based on external demand, that when they start to encounter difficulty with that, that can have a really negative impact on self-concept. Um, and so being aware that just because kids are having a difficulty showing what they know, that that doesn't mean that they don't know. Um, and jumping in with some executive function supports can be really, really helpful in preventing people from developing a negative self-concept about being smart, like kids really focus on being smart. Um, and then it's not a smart problem. It's an executive function skill problem. And so we can jump in and we can support that and we can teach that. Um, and we can make sure that kids understand that those pieces and help them move forward. I see that um, a lot of older learners who recognize an executive dysfunction later in their schooling get really frustrated because they identify as these intellectual individuals who are really able, right, to do a lot of things because they are. Um, and then all of a sudden the demands get much higher. For whatever reason, I see it a lot when um, AP biology hits, <laughs> right, um, in high school, and the demand is just so much, and they have to use these skills that they might not have had to use before. 
right? So that acknowledgement and normalization, as Lisa's saying, that this is an executive function skill deficit that we can strengthen and we can teach and, and improve is key. And, and if you hear them say negative things out loud, typically what's happening in their head is magnified in volumes. So the more we can model when things get challenging, what do you do in those situations? Actually modeling, making mistakes. When I was teaching in the classroom, I would literally make mistakes on purpose and let the kids call me out and see how that I respond to that situation because we all face challenges. And, and these are individuals who might not have faced as many challenges um, as others may have in a classroom or in an academic setting. So helping them know how to navigate through something that feels challenging, that growth mindset is so huge. Just reframing that thought process. You know, this is hard and we can figure out a different way, a different approach. Oftentimes those who struggle most that I see with executive function skill deficits, they um, are the ones who don't even know there's a different way. They don't even know there's a different approach to take than what they've been taking that hasn't been successful. So that acknowledgement, again, going back to the guidelines, how do we provide options of different ways of doing things is key and helping them find what's going to be best for them as well. So, so just, uh, just so that maybe I could rephrase it and, and tell me if I'm on the right track. Uh, so this is, this is a kid that's, that never really has to study for tests, does really well. And then they get into something like, uh, like an AP bio class or an, a, or an AP US history class or, or a high level class that makes big demands and bam, they get their head spun around because they, they've never had to learn how to, how to study or how to, you know, uh, whatever, right? That's, that's where we're seeing, that's, is that kind of what your, your, is that the illustration that you're kind of putting out there? Yeah, and I think that's a lot of people I went to college with. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, I mean, so a lot of these skills wind up being modeled for you and taught explicitly. So if you were lucky enough to have an instructor somewhere along the line that taught you how to be organized and taught you um, thinking strategies and the fact that you need to have strategies even, um, right. that that can make a huge difference. So I happen to have parents that were really great at that and a lot of teachers that thought about that along the way. And I remember getting to undergrad, being surrounded by tons of really, really smart people and just having a lot of peers that couldn't organize themselves to just get the project done, to pick the topic, um, to get the research done, to organize where their notes are. Um, and I think that, you know, that has a big impact on people, but kids can experience that well before hitting those really difficult content pieces. Yeah. Um, so for kids that have ADHD, where it's presenting much earlier, I mean, I'm, I'm hanging out in sec a lot of second grade classrooms this year, and I'm seeing second graders who have tons of knowledge because they're super, super passionate about lizards or the titanic and then they have to do something with that knowledge and they're so eager to share it and they're really really excited but they can't get the project done because of those executive function demands and then they start to get really upset and be like well maybe i didn't know as much as i thought i did so it's yeah. in and saying no you're totally an expert on the titanic and i would love for you to share it with everyone here's how we're going to get this project done yeah i think uh you know uh, I think that that's that leads to a couple more of the questions that we have, and and one of those is is um, does anybody on the panel uh, have any suggestions uh, on how to measure executive functioning uh, slash dysfunction with students um, with IDDs in, in a classroom setting? So is there a way that we can kind of tease that out, you know, before we're getting to the point maybe where where students getting their heads spun around, spun around, you know what I mean? And they're like, ah, I'm not my self determination, self worth have gone down. Do you have any suggestions? I'm gonna let the neuropsychologist handle that. Yeah, right, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think as, you know, as a classroom teacher, um, you're absolutely well equipped to assess what components of the knowledge does the child have. Um, so if you can modify the format and the child is more successful, then you know it was the format getting in, way, in the way and not the information. If you can provide supports for uh, the way that a child is understanding what the task is, we've write, we write all the instructions down, we give you picture cues, uh, whatever it is that will help that child get the information out. If you then have 
performance that is at the standard that you're expecting for that child, whether it's a child with an intellectual disability or whether it's a child with ADHD or whether it's a typically developing child who just doesn't have the brain development yet to manage all of the components of the task. I think that's how you assess whether it's knowledge-based or cognitive control processes, which is really what we're talking about. Well, and so then I, how, do, how do I then engage a student that's easily distracted um, not just through, you know, that traditional content hook, but by really kind of targeting these, these executive function, this executive functioning area, how, how would I go about doing that? Just something practical in my classroom that I could do as a practitioner. So I think the first thing to think about is that inhibitory control and attention are slightly different concepts. Um, and Lisa Jacobson could definitely elaborate on that. But I think like for for inhibitory control to even be used in the first place, you need to start with attention. So we can't get kids to stop and, and start behaviors that are goal-directed, which is what inhibitory control is, if they're not even paying attention in the first place. Um, and so lots of cues and reminders can be really helpful for kids that are having um, attentional problems, but also practicing with them. Um, so there are some games that show that it's good for attention. It's good for a purposeful movement break that can be helpful for kids. And it's also good for practicing inhibitory control. So something as simple as Simon says um, can be really, really helpful because it's that just like what um, Lisa Jacobson was talking about with that go, no go game that they had on the computer to test kids inhibitory control. Go, no go games actually help kids practice those skills. So Simon says red light, green light, um, freeze dance, those kinds of things can be helpful and not just for little kids. They can actually, you can use them forever. In fact, I um, last year had people at the UDL IRN um, play Simon Says with me in a um, EF based um, presentation and they didn't do so well. Um, so it might be something that people need to practice, you know, and keep it going back to. I think additionally too, those are all really great suggestions. I think under understanding what easily distractible means for that individual is important too. What are they being distracted by, right? We can set up all of these great opportunities to scaffold and support, make sure we have clear directions, explicit expectations that are fully understood by the individual, but we need to understand like, what is this distractibility coming from, right? Is it something they're thinking about that we have zero control over? Is it an executive function skill that we need to scale up? The inhibitory control piece, like Lisa gave those awesome examples of how to do that. Um, but I think it's really about getting super curious about what is this distractibility piece? How do we build engagement Maybe they already know everything that they're being taught in their math class, and that's distractible to them and they shut down. Maybe they feel like they know it all, maybe they don't, but actually identifying what that distractible point is, is really important to figure out what you do next, I think. Oh, those are all great. I got one more and then, and then uh, we can move on. Um, so a couple of our folks are wondering how the performance of EF skills has changed with the increase in more reading tests, more math time, less recess, art, music, those sorts of things. Has there been a change? Do we know if there is? And if so, what does that look like? I was gonna defer to <laughs> Dr. Chuck. I, I can jump in if you want me to. <laughs> yeah. um, so, I would jump in and I would say that, you know, I don't know that we have specific studies that are going to show us that, you know, over the last 50 years, we've had an increase in, you know, X or Y component of executive difficulties in the classroom. Um, you know, there are some data suggesting that the rate of ADHD is increasing. We don't have any causality on that at all. We don't know why that is specifically, in part, probably just we're better at diagnosing it, um, just like autism. Um, but on the other hand, I think that what we know, what people have already talked about, Lisa and Alexis have already talked about, and, and certainly what we'll talk about coming up, um, is that the you know, the level of demand that's presented in the classroom, the amount of opportunities for movement, you know, the ways that we help children regroup and refocus um, have just changed over time. Um, and so if we are expecting 
I, my background in the schools, um, I was a school psychologist. I was in a pre-K setting for seven years. Um, those children have to wiggle. You have to give them opportunities to squiggle around. They might listen perfectly. Like my patients who spin while they're telling me word definitions. That's fine. That allows them to focus and allows them to produce the information. If you do require like Alexis's cartoon, if you require everybody to sit in rows and stay in their seat and hold still, there's going to be a certain point at which there's just not going to be the control left um, in order to manage the work demands because all of that cognitive energy is controlling their bodies. Anecdotally, great, sorry, I was just going to share anecdotally. I don't have this. I don't have the statistics on that either. So that's why I defer to you. <laughs> uh, we are seeing a, a lot more uh, of this in the in the classrooms and reported by parents at home because a lot of kids are holding it together all day long just to get through the day it doesn't mean they're more focused they might be controlling their emotions as best as they can to get through it and then exploding as soon as homework comes up um, or when they get out of that environment because of that that emotional regulation and the physical regulation because they haven't been able to move around all day so um i i think being mindful of um building in different points of struggle and challenge and helping through those moments and, and giving the experiences of, um, we can't always be in our best position, but let's practice this and let's practice ways to cope and, and get through um, different situations is, is very helpful to be able to build the self-regulatory skills in, in order to inhibit um, and activate the rest of our skills to be successful across contexts is important. I think I think that that's a that's a really interesting nuance there, Alexis, saying that, you know, maybe kids are just getting really good at holding it in. And then when they get home, boom, it hits. Right. And so I, I that one that one made me start thinking. So there you go. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. I think we're going to go ahead and jump now into the solutions. So we've got about 20 minutes left and we want to make sure we hear all these great ideas. So I'm going to reshare my screen. First, I'm going to mute, and then I'm going to share my screen. And I think we're starting again with Lisa Carey. OK. So just like I started off by explaining that executive function can be broken up into three categories, which are inhibitory control, working memory, and flexible thinking, um, I'm going to give some suggestions based on those categories. Um, so the first thing is cues for gaining attention. Um, one thing with technology, specifically in the classroom, but any kind of classroom items, um, is that they can be really distracting to students who are easily distractible. And so if you have items that are your preferred items in front of you or around you while you're trying to also stop using them and switch your attention to what the demands are, that can be really difficult. Um, so I've seen a lot of teachers say, you know, like eyes up, hands up and stuff like that to get kids to drop whatever they're, they're touch, touching or what they're using. Um, and one great thing I saw come out of Baltimore County Public Schools is where all the kids have laptops, the teachers have asked them to use what they call a clam close. So the laptop has to be clicked shut. And now that we have our clam closed, now I'm going to give you the directions. The directions are finished. You can open your laptop back up. Um, and that kind of fits along with clearly stated behavior expectations. When kids are floating from one setting to another, which happens a lot in the school setting, remembering those behavior expectations and stopping and switching as you go from class to class can be really difficult. So reviewing that with students, having expectations that are clear, um, non-examples and examples to help them understand and navigate all the different um, environments they're in. And by going over those behavior expectations, you're reminding kids of what they have to inhibit. Um, the flexible seating piece, we just talked about that a lot, about how kids need to wiggle. So having um, the ability to wiggle can actually help them get work done and maintain the control over the important stuff rather than controlling whether or not I'm sitting still. Um, we don't use executive function skills when things are automatic. Um, we use executive function skills 
when things are not habitual. So if we want something to be easier, we can practice it and make it automatic. So if I have to use strategies to remember how to multiply, I'm using my executive function skills to do that maybe rather than problem solve. And so if I'm memorizing these things um, and practicing these things, they become automatic and then I can use my executive function skills for other things. Um, and then again, just removing distractors from kids' vicinity and to front load information. So we have a lot of tech navigation stuff that has to happen now sometimes. Um, if you can get all of that navigation stuff done, again, put the technology to the side, do whatever kind of instructional piece you wanted to do, and then have the kids ready to go straight from instruction to doing rather than going from instruction to now let's all log in. Um, that can be really helpful because the kids aren't switching back and forth. Um, so next slide and we'll talk about working memory. Um, so process charts can help kids because if you've got them posted either on the wall or in the learning management system um, or on kids' desks, it re decreases the demand for what they have to hold in mind while they're doing their tasks. Um, so I've seen great things in classrooms where it's here are the steps to solving this kind of problem just so you can reference it. Um, vocabulary support so kids aren't trying to recall vo the vocabulary they were supposed to use. Um, putting all these things inside the learning environment decreases the demand. And you can slowly pair these back as these things become more automatic, but as you're first introducing new skills and concepts, it's helpful to have these cues and reminders for kids to decrease that working memory demand. Um, I like to think of it as you can increase the new content that you're having kids learn, or you can increase the skill level, but you shouldn't do both at the same time. So you kind of want to choose all the time, like, do I have a lot of new content going on, then let's use a skill that everyone's familiar with versus we're going to try a new skill, but let's use content that people are familiar with. Because if we add both at the same time, sometimes that can be overwhelming to students. Um, and then finally, looking at the flexible thinking piece. So if we go to the next slide, thank you. Um, the flexible thinking piece is the part that is specified in the UDL guidelines. And that's because it's the highest level, most difficult stuff. And so we want to make sure that kids are getting a lot of help with that. Um, it has to do with strategic thinking, being able to take multiple perspectives of a problem um, to work out a problem. So coming up with not just one solution, but multiple solutions and being able to monitor if that solution is working or if you need to pick a different strategy or a different way to solve the problem. Those tasks are very, very difficult. That's, that's high level stuff. So we want to, as much as possible, aid in thinking habits and strategic thinking. So we definitely want to teach kids explicitly, we want to teach them strategies. And we want them to um, get cues and reminders to use those strategies. And also to understand that not every strategy works for every situation, and it doesn't always work for everybody. Um, so you need to kind of take ownership of the ones that work for you and have a few different tools in your tool bag. Um, when we can aid kids in taking multiple perspectives, that can be really helpful. So sometimes taking multiple perspectives means looking at a math problem and thinking about different ways of solving it. But it can also mean thinking about a character in literature, understanding their perspective versus the perspective of another character. Um, so I've seen lots of kids get really good at reading comprehension until they have to make inferences about a character's point of view, and then they get stuck. And this getting stuck piece is that flexible thinking piece. Um, so you wanna help kids and support them as they learn how to do that because it's not actually a skill you just naturally develop. Um, it takes time. So when we're asking kids in like sixth and seventh grade to do this, that's actually a really difficult task for a sixth or seventh grader. Um, I wanna make sure we give them supports. Um, the next piece is that whole troubleshooting piece. So troubleshooting might have to do with, oh, we'll go back a slide, sorry. Um, troubleshooting might have to do with the problem you're trying to solve, or it could be that the learning aid or the instructional technology you're using is not functioning properly. So I want you all to like picture how frustrated you get 
when your laptop or whatever device you're trying to use is not working properly. You're trying to log on to maybe a webinar and it's not working and you're getting really frustrated. The more frustrated you get, the less likely you are to be using your executive function skills well. So we need to teach kids the self-regulation part of being stuck and then teach them strategies for getting unstuck. So um, I've seen a lot of teachers adding to their classroom environments, if I get stuck today, resources for the kids. And that's been really helpful for guiding independent learning, making kids feel like they don't have to get panicked and anxious when something goes wrong, and also giving them tools and strategies to, to use on their own. And I've seen the kids even remind each other, like, don't get stressed out. We've got our, I got stuck tools. You can use those today. Um, and that can help the kids think through their problems. So I think that that is the end for me. We can move on. All right, great, I will jump in. So I'm gonna move a little bit in a different aspect than Lisa Carey did. Um, but one of the things that we've all referred to, and I, I really liked uh, the Bronfen Brenner diagram that Alexis shared, those concentric circles sort of explaining how um, different factors impact us and we interact with those different factors um, to affect all of our behavior. Um, we've been talking about the level of demand in classrooms. And um, I think one important thing to do is to think about how you specifically uh, can control that level of demand. Um, how complicated are the directions that you give? Um, as Lisa indicated, you know, are the laptops all the way closed before you give the directions? Um, but also just for many children who have a lot of difficulty with language, so children with language-based learning disabilities like reading disability, for example, or speech language disabilities, um, the more simple the directions are, the more sort of brain power you're going to free for them to be able to actually take in what they're supposed to be doing, what they're supposed to be doing and not uh, get stuck on the directions. Um, so simple directions with lists or visual prompts, um, a nice chart that can show you what you need to do, is it done or not? Um, how can you check that? You're going from red to green. Um, so it's, it's very obvious, um, that sort of evaluation process. Um, I think Lisa mentioned um, routinization or becoming more fluent and automatic with skills. So relying on routines and, and demonstrating and encouraging systems for approaching things. You know, all of the nice acronyms that we learned about, you know, my dear Aunt Sally or um, the different kinds of, you know, dirty monkey smell bad. How do I figure out how to do long division? Um, these nice things that just help us um, be able to approach a problem in a systematic kind of way. Um, and then we've, we've talked about movement, allowing wiggle room so that children have the attentional capacity to attend to the content rather than um, trying to hold their bodies still. Next slide, please. Um, so another component is, as we've talked about, explicitly teaching the executive skills along with the kind of content that you're addressing. So whether it's reading or math or written language or something entirely different, um, thinking specifically about how you can scaffold children in using and developing their metacognitive skills or their skills for thinking about how they approach a task and how they engage in the task and then how they self-evaluate whether or not they actually did what they were supposed to do. Um, and we're sort of indebted to the late uh, Mark Ilvesacker in the rehab world for what's called goal plan do review. And that's been um, used in different ways. I put a little diagram on the on the slide for you, but this idea of helping children identify what they're supposed to be doing, um, identify how they're going to do it, what their process is going to be, what they need, if they have everything that they need, actually implementing, and then deciding and looking and evaluating whether or not that actually was done correctly. And you can do that at a kindergarten level and you can do that at a college level. And the rest of us do that every day as well. Um, did I manage to get all the things I went to the grocery store for? Oh dear, I forgot the milk again, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so that's a component that, that can be really helpful in terms of teaching those strategies. Um, another one, and I think Alexis indicated this as well, um, explicitly modeling your thought processes for your students and whether that's task specific. So how do I approach a reading passage when I'm looking for um, character perspective or um, 
more broad things in terms of specific problem solving strategies that might apply to multiple types of assignments. Um, so really being clear and explicit about what you're doing and how you're approaching it, because again, um, not every child has that example um, or has been able to pick that up just sort of on the fly. Um, we've mentioned all of us so far, the, the component of frustration and anxiety and um, managing setbacks. Um, what happens when there's hurdles? What happens when there's hiccups? Um, being very clear about um, how do you handle that? How are you asking students to handle that? How can you give them the language to talk to themselves to work through that? One of the things that we believe is true about working memory is that that skill for holding information in mind to direct behavior in a goal-directed way is actually dependent on internal self-talk. So being able to turn your language into yourself to direct your own actions is really important. And the more upset or frustrated you get, the less able you are to do that in a very calm and rational and stepping back kind of way. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and we talked about this briefly, so I'll, I'll be quick on here, um, but developing automaticity with basic skills is really critical. Um, and the point is that it does make other cognitive resources or other abilities more available to perform tasks that are a little bit more complex. So developing task routines and daily schedule routines, kids always know that we're going to do things in this order. There's a component of creativity that we want, but it frees up our brain if we always know that we're going to do tasks in a certain way or we're always going to rotate through classes in a certain way. Um, one of the examples that I think, <clears throat> excuse me, comes up frequently is high schoolers that are in block scheduling where you may not know from day to day what order your classes are in and you may not remember to get the right things from your locker because you're not going to the class you went to this time yesterday. Um, and those kinds of demands for students can actually really derail their actual ability to show you what they know. Um, so practicing with skills, providing prompts and scaffolding where they're, where they're going to need it in order so that they can develop greater automaticity and become um, routine based so that everything else um, can be focused on a little bit more explicitly. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, in that context of thinking about uh, development and the, the way that our external factors impact our behavior, um, it's really critical, and, and I'm a neuropsychologist, so I have to talk about the brain. Um, it's really critical that we think about where children are in the course of development when they're standing in front of you in a classroom. Um, executive function is a very complex set of skills. And so it's highly dependent on the maturation of the white matter tracks in our brains, and specifically those that link a lot of regions together. There's no one area of your brain. You don't do executive function with your frontal lobe. You do executive function with your subcortical, frontal, cerebellar, white matter tracks that link all of your brain regions together in a very integrated concert. Um, and one of the things that's important to know is that these skills and the white matter supporting them develop into your 30s. So there's lots of time for many of us and your students, whether they're in sixth grade or eighth grade or kindergarten, are absolutely not at the point where they're going to be one of these days. Um, that those white matter tracks are really slow to develop and there's lots of things that can potentially go wrong, but even in very typically developing children, it just takes time. And what we know is that the component of your brain that most helps you handle frustration, that most helps you handle um, anger, that really um, is important for managing um, that sort of affective regulation is the latest to develop. So those are critical things to remember when we address executive function, um, whether it's in the classroom or outside. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And along with this, that concept of sort of stage environment or development environment mismatch is really critical. So thinking about while executive function skills are developing, you can absolutely expect progress for kids in these skills as well as in the core skills that are the academic content. Um, but there are going to be many times, as we've mentioned, where their skills are going to be overmatched. And so that development expectation 
uh, link is not going to be perfect. Um, so it's important to think about the fact that both a failure to act or a failure to do a task correctly in acting out or having that child that threw the laptop, those may represent that student and classroom demand mismatch. So if you can offer alternatives that better map onto where that student is in their ability to cognitively control their information, cognitively control their actions, or self-regulate their affect, that's going to better allow them to demonstrate skills. And so really thinking about that motivation component, um, as well as um, the acting out component may help us understand where that gap is not working well, or where that gap is largest, rather. I think that's the last one. Yep, great. So Susan, I'm mindful of the time. So we're going to go quickly through these. And um, also to note that I will, this will be my first UDL IRN conference that I'm attending this year. And I'm so excited to be presenting more about this. So if you're there, we can talk more and more and more about this. Um, so just thinking about uh, what, what can we do? And it really goes back to the, the tenets of UDL and the purpose behind it, right? We want to be intentional and goal-directed with everything we do. And when we're thinking about intentional goal-directed work, we also want to think about the environment and how that affects the process. We want to think about the skills that we've explicitly taught to be able to take on any assignment or task that is given, making sure that we have that developmental match as much as possible, even though in a classroom of all fourth graders or 10th graders or college students, we might have expectations that they're all at the same level, but we also need to be cognizant of the, the neurodiversity that's among everybody and make sure we're skilling them up and being prepared to execute the tasks that we're asking them to do. So remembering UDL to be flexible, accessible, and proactive is essential. Next slide, please. Uh, so thinking about expert learning, I think everything we've been talking about, even though we haven't said expert learning is this, this, and this, I think we're all talking about the same thing. How do we actually feel like we are experts and we know how to best navigate situations? So expert learning is about identifying how we get distracted, what barriers are in our way, what skills do we need to develop to minimize some of those performance issues that might arise at different points of our development and learning. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so thinking about, uh, I just love this quote, and if anybody has uh, any free time on your hands and you want to check out another great book, I'll have a reference to this one with the orange uh, quote on the side. It's all about the environment being the third teacher. So Einstein's, I never teach my pupils. I only attempt to provide the conditions for which they can learn. And being mindful of that and what works best for you as far as executive function skill um, access and um, activation might not be the best for everybody else and being mindful of taking perspective of your learners when you give them tasks and you put those demands upon them. We don't really want to lessen the demands. We want to build skills and scaffold them to be able to meet their potential wherever they're at. So how do we actually explicitly teach those things along the way, starting super early in preschool when possible, but then not forgetting that even in high school and college, individuals will need executive function support or understand that they might need some refreshers or some supports that'll help them be as successful as possible. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, I am a huge advocate of not just using a tool or a strategy, but understanding the purpose of why we need a tool or a strategy. So when we think about these higher order executive function skills, actually of planning, organizing, and prioritizing, which takes you to really need to build up that um, emotional regulation and the inhibitory control, control piece first, then the working memory to be able to do some of these higher order skills that we expect learners as young as kindergarten now to be able to do on their own sometimes. We wanna be mindful of what tools we put in place to help them to be as successful as possible. It's not about the tool, it's about understanding why it's important, how it can be helpful and how you feel after you've seen success in learning how to plan, prioritize, schedule. And of course, reflection. Don't forget that key piece. How did that help you? I noticed that you mapped out your time to make sure you got everything in that you needed to to finish that project. How did that help you? How did that feel? Why do you think you were successful after breaking things down in a certain way? Add that in, because that's actually building the skills by knowing that this will help me in a different situation across context. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> Again, organization, I always say everything has a space in place. Doesn't need to be perfect. 
I always keep my office not completely perfect because that's not reality. <laughs> so the expectation isn't everything is purpose, but you have a system that goes along to keeping things organized and helps you to kind of support and navigate that. A lot of adults forget that we develop their own systems that help us be successful. Uh, but a lot of young learners or even older learners need that explicit direct prompt. You know, you need a system for that. So you don't forget it to make sure it stays organized. Okay, next slide. Time management, here we are right now, running late. <laughs> um, time management, this is my key point. There's many to say, but time management using both visual cues, auditory cues, you know, little vibration cues that help you to understand where you're at across time are all great ways to help build time management skills. It doesn't answer or teach how to manage your time internalized, but they are tools to help build those skills if they are taught in the right way. Next <laughs> slide, please. Thank you. Um, essentially, we want to build this toolbox of skills and You'll see this slide again for me many, many times. I love this image. I don't know who created it, and you Wells, but it's amazing. Thinking about how do we build in the self-monitoring, understanding how to actually express these amazing ideas that we have in our head that sometimes we can't organize, plan, prioritize, and express in the same way. And understanding, can I succeed? Will I succeed? Developing that self-internalized narrative that can help propel you forward and really understanding how to best navigate all of that is key to developing and strengthening executive function skills. Uh, almost last slide, um, encouraging advocacy. This is what it's all about, right? Self-monitoring, how am I doing? Do I need assistance? How do we build in those skills? Ask questions to those around you to make sure that they know that that's even a question they can ask, making sure they feel comfortable asking questions and continually self-monitoring and modeling that yourself. I don't think I did this right. Maybe I need to look at it again and going through that process, externalizing those thoughts for those who can't do it on their own to hear your way of thinking. And finally, I've used this slide before and I will never stop using it. It's kind of silly, it's kind of fun. Remember that connection and feedback is so powerful and so key. If there is something that's not going wrong or somebody's not working to their potential, ask questions, give specific feedback. I'm noticing that you know, you're not as focused as you normally are, what's going on? Figure out exactly if there's a skill, I just don't know how to start this task. I know I should be able to start it, but I just can't right now. Asking those questions, drilling down, getting deep. This is silly. I do not belong in the company of Albert Einstein and Charles Schultz, but I thought this was hysterical. Um, uh, this is a little quick example of perspective taking. One of my learners couldn't take perspective for another way, so I bought these really funny, crazy glasses. And I said, let's put on our glasses and take another. Let's, we need a different lens to look through. And as soon as we did, it just shifted the whole experience. Doing things that are going to help connect, engage, and be genuine are huge. So this is me saying creating a safe space for experimentation, practicing and trying out skills that may not always work the, the first time. How do we actually allow them to feel comfortable making mistakes and then exploring and developing these skills along the way? And finally, wow, I can't believe I did that so quickly. Sorry. I know we're running late. Um, these are just a few books that I, they're like my doctrine sort of. Um, these are really great uh, pieces of literature that I think are every educator should read, experience, and understand a little bit more of. So of course, growth mindset. The third teacher is the one I was referring to before, thinking about how the environment plays a role in learning. Uh, flow, I think I just like saying Chicksep Mahale. <laughs> He's the man, check it out. Uh, and of course, UDL. There's so many great UDL books out there, but the, the core literature uh, theory and practice, more to come, understood, cast people who have shaped all of our ideas in making education just a little bit better each day. So thank you to everybody listening and for these great resources to help guide us all. <laughs> wow, Lisa, that was a sprint to the end there. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> um, Brian, I think you wanted to share a little summary before we move on to uh, wrapping up tonight. Uh, yeah, for sure, Sue. So um, there's there's tons of stuff coming in, and I think people are still uh, trying to process all of the strategies that, that you ladies laid out. Um, but uh, it seems to be that the the comment of uh, of automaticity uh, seems to have resonated really in in a large way uh, with our both our people in the webinar and our people online. Um, and and 
interestingly, not only saying it about about students, but about everyone. Like uh, this is this is why I can I do my best planning and thinking in the shower, or um, you know, uh, it must be really hard for for adults, especially at teachers and staff meetings, to learn after school because because they're already drained and there's no automaticity to it, and there and there's just so much. So I. Um, I think that everybody's still processing the strategies, but um, it's really started to resonate. So thank you so much, ladies. Wonderful. It's been an awesome evening. Really appreciate all of your uh, work in preparing tonight's um, presentation and sharing all of your wonderful insights. Um, and as uh, Alexis pointed out, all of our presenters will be at the UDL IRN Summit in 2018. So come and hear more. Uh, the registration is up. It's time to go ahead and get yourself registered, get your hotel reserved. Um, we have an excellent uh, summit schedule up. If you, you could take a look at some of the pre-conference offerings that are available, um, and there is one on executive function. So if you want to learn more about that, there is a half-day pre-conference focusing on UDL and executive function. And then also uh, Lisa, Lisa, and Alexis will be there talking more about uh, executive function and UDL and what you heard this evening. So um, go get to udl-irn.org and get registered. We're, Excited to see you there, April 25 through 27. Also, just a reminder that UDL chat happens every first and third Wednesday of the month. So it is a free way to find out what's happening in the UDL world, share it, uh, information, ask questions, give answers, just to connect with others who are passionate about universal design for learning. So check that out, um, make sure you join. And finally, we just want to say thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Brian Dean, for um, monitoring our chat. And thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate having you all here. Uh, again, join us at the summit. We're excited about um, uh, the program that we've put together, and we'd love to have you there. Thank you all, and everyone have a good night.